So the form of pyrite that I will be talking about today was noticed uh, by Alva de Wiedmestaden uh, of the Imperial Porcelain Works in Vienna, Austria, who saw this in a particular meteorite. He saw patterns of plates in this particular meteorite. And uh, some 92 years later, Osman noticed the same sort of patterns on a different scale on a steel ingot. So these plates uh, have come to be known as Wiedmannstatten ferrite. Now, this is a picture of a meteorite that I took in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, a very large meteorite, and a cross section reveals the patterns that we are talking about, the Wiedmannstatten patterns here. Now, I should emphasize that uh, we don't really understand how these plates form because they have cooled uh, over a very long period of time and there has been much uh, rearrangement of atoms during, during that period. Okay. But the sort of uh, ferrite I want to focus on is that which is found in steels on a much, much smaller scale. So this illustrates the beautiful uh, white plates of uh, Wiedemann Sarden ferrite. Uh, the rest of the matrix is perlite. And one thing I want you to notice is how clean these plates are. Okay, so it appears as if there isn't much of a structure within those plates. Uh, and the scale here is about 10, 10 micrometers. In terms of the time temperature transformation diagram, uh, this is the last displacive transformation uh, to form as we increase the temperature from martensite, bainite, and then Wiedemann-Sutton ferrite. Beyond this point, uh, atomic mobility is sufficiently high to allow transformations that are closer to equilibrium to happen. So just like bainite and martensite, there's a Wiedemann-Sutton ferrite start temperature. And I'll explain, or we will discover later, why this is greater than this. Now, we've discussed uh, two mechanisms by which you can change the structure of austenite into that of the transformation product. And one of those mechanisms uh, involves displacements. So you basically alter the way in which the atoms are arranged, the pattern in which the atoms are arranged by a, a physical deformation, uh, the consequences of which you can see. Uh, and in that process, there is no uh, partitioning of solute atoms. Uh, and there is a large shape change which dominates the morphology of the product and various other aspects. On the other hand, you can take the austenite and you can break all the bonds and rearrange the atoms into a different pattern while maintaining the external shape of your crystal. Uh, and this has the advantage that you don't uh, cause a lot of strain energy, but it requires atoms to be able to move over a length scale, which is roughly the same as the microstructural scale of the transformation product. And during that process of the um, breaking of bonds and rearranging them into a different pattern in an uncoordinated manner, uh, the atoms which prefer to be in the product phase will increase their concentration relative to what was there in the original parent region that transformed. Okay, so we may get the long range diffusion of solute atoms. So this kind of a transformation is often described as a military transformation and this kind as a civilian transformation. And the analogy is as follows that if you have a labeled queue of soldiers waiting for a military transport to arrive, then when the transport arrives, they will board the bus in a highly disciplined manner. So you can identify that this person in the queue was next to this person and so on. So you maintain a correspondence between positions in the queue and positions in the transport. And in the context of transformations, we maintain an atomic correspondence so we can identify the neighbors of all the atoms, uh, both in the parent and product lattice as being unchanged. 
civilian transport is somewhat different uh, that you have a queue of civilians here and uh, they will board the bus in a disorderly manner and go and sit next to their friends even though they were not neighbors in the queue uh, so we've lost all connection between the positions in the queue and the positions in the bus uh, but by doing that you've minimized uh, strain energy because they can sit next to their friends okay irrespective of position in the queue now the third kind of transformation is as follows so we had the military transformation and the civilian transformation this is a paramilitary transformation where we have a, a queue here and some little atoms and as far as the large atoms are concerned they move onto the transport in a disciplined manner but the little ones are free to move about and associate uh, in positions where they prefer to be. Okay. So this is a paramilitary transformation in which some atoms are able to diffuse while the change in crystal structure is achieved by a displacing mechanism. And of course, the analogy that we, I'm thinking about here is that carbon atoms are in interstitial positions and even if they diffuse during the course of the transformation, uh, the crystal structure change is achieved by a displacement of the substitutional lattice, and there is no change in the chemical composition as far as the substitutional atoms are concerned. And we maintain an atomic correspondence between positions in the parent and positions in the product lattices. And Wiedemann Sanferrat, we will see, is a transformation like this that it is displacive as far as the change in crystal structure is concerned. But during the transformation, the carbon atoms are able to partition into the retained austenite so that the weakness and ferrite never has an excess of carbon. And there are, there are two specific uh, morphologies associated with weakness and ferrite. The first is this uh, primary weakness and ferrite. And notice that I'm drawing these as thin wedge shapes, and I'll explain that later. And they nucleate directly at the austenite grain boundaries and grow into one grain only, because after all, the change in crystal structure is achieved by a displacement. So you cannot sustain such displacements, uh, choreographic movement of atoms across large crystallographic discontinuities such as grain boundaries. Okay, so primary weakness and ferrite nucleates at an austenite grain boundary and then is limited to the grain in which it grows. <clears throat> Secondary witness and ferrite can nucleate from layers of ferrite uh, which form by a reconstructive transformation mechanism uh, at a higher temperature and they happen to be in the correct sort of crystallographic orientation to stimulate the formation of Wiedemann ferrite from the interface between the high temperature ferrite and the austenite. So this is called secondary Wiedemann ferrite. Now I pointed out to you, if you look at an optical micrograph of Wiedemann ferrite, you see clean plates which etch white. Okay, um, This is in contrast to the images I showed you for bainite. Uh, on, on a similar sort of scale, where they etch extremely dark relative to the background, which is in this case is untempered martensite. And that's because, as we saw in lecture three, uh, what appears to be a single plate of, be, uh, of bainite has thousands of little platelets in it. And all the resulting interfaces are therefore attacked by the etchant, and therefore in optical microscopy, the bainite appears dark. It's a reflection of the intricate structure present inside what appears on an optical scale to be a single plate of bainite. So the clue is that this cannot contain much structure, right? In, inside a plate of Wiedemann's van ferrite, there cannot be much structure. Now, why do we say that this is a, a displacive transformation? Well, you know, one consequence of changing the pattern in which atoms are arranged uh, by a deformation is that you observe a shape change. And uh, this is a, a movie 
uh, using confocal laser microscopy. Uh, here you see the austenite grain boundaries which are revealed by thermal grooving and then we induce the formation of Wiedemann sand perhaps by changing the temperature. The temperature is at the top left hand corner and you will see Wiedemann sand perhaps plates uh, growing There you go. Now that's quite interesting because you know you can actually visualize the plates growing at a certain rate. Okay. So this emphasizes that a displacive transformation need not be very rapid. And in this case, there are good reasons why it's not very rapid. Okay. So there is no question that the transformation is associated with a shape deformation. And uh, you can do other experiments. To illustrate that. Here, for example, uh, are scratches which were straight when the material was austenitic and they are deflected uh, in the manner of a shear deformation uh, by the formation of Wiedemann stand ferrite plates. And these are uh, Dolansky interference microscopy uh, fringes, which are similar to the scratches, except they're not physical scratches but caused by um, interference of light. And you can see that the fringes are displaced. Okay. Now, there is no question that there is uh, there are displacements associated with this transformation. But we know that Wiedemann sand ferrite can form at temperatures which are about T zero. If the temperature is about T zero, then it's not possible for the ferrite to grow in a diffusionless manner. Okay. Carbon must partition during transformation. So the plate of Wiedemann stand ferrite never actually contains any excess carbon. And as it grows, the austenite becomes richer in carbon. So just to summarize, um, Wiedemann stand ferrite can grow at small undercoolings, at temperatures well above T0. And carbon diffusion is essential during the transformation. Without that, it simply won't happen. Now, there is something puzzling here, okay? Uh, so I've emphasized that Wiedemann ferrite can grow at small undercoolings. And yet we've seen that there are some really quite substantial displacements associated with the growth of Wiedemann ferrite. And that can cause the development of elastic strains in surrounding austenite. And, you know, in the case of martensite, we said the stored energy due to that uh, shape deformation is of the order of 600 joules per mole. But here I'm claiming that Wiedemann sand ferrite can grow at small undercoolings below the A3 temperature, uh, 50 degrees, let's say, um, centigrade, where there isn't 600 joules per mole of free energy available. Okay, so there is something really puzzling that we get the large shape deformations and yet. Wiedemann sand ferrite plates can grow at relatively small undercoolings. But it's clear that carbon must partition during transformation because the transformation can occur well above the T0 temperature. Okay, so this puzzle, uh, the first part of this puzzle is solved. Uh, this is the shape deformation when we measure it accurately of a single plate of Wiedemann sand ferrite. It, it's no different from that of uh, martensite or, or bainite uh, in, in terms of its character, uh, which means that there is a large shear and a volume expansion normal to the habit plane here, okay? Uh, so this, uh, this would be the interface plane, the habit plane. But this kind of a shape deformation has a large strain energy associated with it. So it can only occur at large undercoolings if Friedman sun ferrite forms at large undercoolings. So it's possible, but only if the Friedman sun ferrite forms at very large undercoolings. Uh, now, we know that it can form at small undercoolings. And the reason is that it's not actually a single plate growing. There are two plates which grow together and accommodate each other's shape deformation so that the overall strain energy is dramatically reduced. 
So when we look at the surface relief and the deflection of the scratches, uh, we actually see tent-shaped surface relief rather than just a single tilt like this. And if you recall from the crystallographic theory of Martinsite, the habit plane, the shape deformation, the orientation relationships are mathematically connected. So if I have this plate causing a displacement in this direction and this plate in a somewhat different direction, not exactly parallel, uh, then the habit planes must also be different. Uh, like so. So the uh, habit plane is irrational, but let's say it's close to 585 austenite. So these two plates have different habit planes. And as a consequence, they form like a thin wedge instead of a lens-like plate. Really quite clever. The, one, of the, um, one of the detrimental aspects is that you have to nucleate two plates together and those two plates have to be of a kind which accommodate each other's shape change to some extent. Which means that the nucleation rate is reduced because the probability of finding two nuclei which are appropriate is going to be smaller. And therefore, the Weidmann and Farai structure is very coarse compared with, say, Bainite. And its mechanical properties may not, therefore, be optimum with respect to toughness and the deflection of cleavage tracks. Uh, so the reason why we, <clears throat> why we see these plates as wedge shaped is because the pair of plates which grow back to back in a self-accommodating manner have somewhat different habit planes. Obviously, they will also have somewhat different orientation relationship with the austenite, and therefore we must be able to find a, a low misorientation boundary between these two plates if you do the crystallographic analysis. So if I uh, take a transmission electron micrograph image of a plate of uh, Weidmann sand ferrite, which has formed at a small undercooling, then you will indeed discover a boundary between the adjacent plates. So there is a little bit of structure inside a plate of Wiedemann sandferrite, but it's nothing to write home about. And therefore the plate appears to be clean. <coughs> now, I mentioned to you that uh, Wiedemann sandferrite forms above the T0 temperature and therefore it never inherits any excess carbon during its growth. The carbon must be partitioned into the austenite. So let's, let's treat that problem now. So we are looking at the diffusion control growth of a plate of Wiedmann-Stern ferrite. And let's say we are transforming at a temperature T, and this is the average carbon concentration in our alloy. The substitutional elements don't participate in the, uh, you know, they are basically the iron to substitution solute ratio remains constant across the transformation interface. They're not diffusing. It's a displacive transformation. So C bar is our average carbon concentration. And at this temperature, C alpha gamma is the concentration of carbon in the ferrite, which is in equilibrium with austenite. And this is the concentration of carbon in the austenite, which is in equilibrium with the ferrite. So obviously the Wiedmann-Stern ferrite is going to grow with uh, a lower carbon concentration than C bar. And the maximum carbon that the austenite can accommodate at the interface while it's in equilibrium with uh, local equilibrium with the ferrite will be C gamma alpha. And this is therefore the nature of the concentration profile which you would develop at the transformation front. Since we are talking about the lengthening of the blade, we are looking at the tip of that blade. So that's our concentration profile. Z star gives us the length of the blade. And as the blade advances, that much carbon will have to be accommodated in the austenite for every increment of transformation. It's the difference between C gamma alpha, C alpha gamma, and 
how much weakness and variety form uh, in a unit of time. So we can express that mathematically as this concentration minus this concentration times the lengthening rate, which gives us the rate at which the solute is partitioned. Okay. Now, if that rate uh, is too large, then this concentration would rise above C gamma alpha. And we, we cannot have that because we are maintaining local equilibrium at the interface. So this rate of solute partition must be balanced by the rate at which solute is taken away from the interface by diffusion. And the diffusion flux at the interface is simply the diffusion coefficient. Uh, I've assumed here there's a constant gradient uh, for simplicity. Uh, so it's the diffusion coefficient times the magnitude of the gradient and the minus sign is because the flux is down this concentration gradient which has a negative slope. So Z star is the length of the plate and this is the diffusion distance ahead of the plate. Uh, this is an approximation, this should be an error function type uh, problem, but it doesn't matter, we are not going to lose the essence of anything uh, in the treatment by assuming that this is a straight line and therefore we define a diffusion distance delta Z. So if I balance uh, these two parts so that we maintain local equilibrium at the interface with these two concentrations, uh, then uh, I can replace this gradient here by C gamma alpha minus C bar divided by the distance delta Z. Okay? So the rate at which solid partition is equal to the rate at which it's carried away by diffusion from the interface. Now, bear in mind that we are dealing with a plate shape, okay? So this is our weedmann staden farad plate, and it's advancing into austenite. And because it's advancing into fresh austenite all the time, the diffusion distance here is constant, although we are accumulating carbon behind the tip of the plate. So if the diffusion distance is constant, you can immediately conclude that the growth rate of the weedmann staden uh, the lengthening rate of the weedmann staden farad plate will also be constant, although the thickening rate uh, will not because we are accumulating carbon behind the advancing tip. So going back to our equations, uh, this was the rate at which solute is partitioned and this was the rate at which it's being carried away by diffusion from the interface. Uh, and therefore we can write the lengthening rate dz star by dt as the diffusion coefficient divided by the diffusion distance and uh, into these concentration terms which come from here and here. So we have this uh, unknown here, the diffusion distance, and we take that to be approximately equal to the tip radius. Uh, so we treat, um, in, in a better calculation, we treat the plate as a parabolic cylinder. Okay? Uh, and a parabolic cylinder is defined by this uh, circular region at the tip with a, a certain radius r at the focal point of this uh, para parabola. So this is a plate in three dimensions and uh, it has a width, a certain width l. Okay, so we've got an equation now for the lengthening rate as a function of the concentration terms and diffusion coefficient and the plate tip radius. Uh, we don't have a solution because we don't know the plate tip radius, okay? Uh, but this is a peculiar equation. You know, the velocity lengthening rate is proportional inversely to the tip radius, that means the lengthening rate increases indefinitely as the tip radius decreases. And that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, we, we don't expect the plate to assume an incredibly small tip radius. And the mistake uh, or the gross approximation that was made in the derivation is that if you make the plate tip radius finer, then you are creating more interface between the Widmer-Sandferrite and the austenite, 
on the addition of a single atom to the Wiedemann-Stern ferrite. Whereas if the plate tip radius is uh, very gentle, uh, uh, is um, very large, then the amount of interface you create when you add an atom to the Wiedemann-Stern ferrite will be much smaller. And there is a cost to creating interface because the interface has uh, an interfacial energy per unit area, which we normally call sigma. So we are going to treat that problem now. The task is to work out the increase in interfacial area as we add an atom to the tip of the plate. And the plate we are modeling as a parabolic cylinder, which looks something like this, okay? where this is the length and at the tip of the plate we have a radius which is r. So if I just take that cylinder at the tip and draw it out like this then this is the distance l and that is the tip radius r. Now the volume of the plate, uh, volume of the cylinder, is simply pi r squared into the length and the surface area is 2 pi r into the length. So it follows that dv by dr is equal to 2 pi r l and dA by dr is equal to uh, 2 pi into L and therefore dA is equal to dV divided by the tip radius r. Now supposing I set this change here to be just one atom then I can work out the free energy change when I add one atom because I simply multiply the change in area by the interfacial energy per unit area. So the change in energy when I add an atom uh, and this is the change in energy due to the increase in interfacial area is equal to the interfacial energy per unit area times the volume per atom and divided by R. So you just compare uh, these two equations. All we have done is replace the dV by um, a volume per atom and multiply it by interfacial energy per unit area because that's the increment in area and therefore this is the increment in the energy. Uh, that is the cost due to the creation of new interfacial area. Now, uh, supposing that the interface is completely flat then the change uh, in free energy when austenite transforms to ferrite is written as this. Okay, So that's the chemical free energy change and we've got to remove from it the cost of creating uh, interface which is sigma Va upon R and that is the net free energy change per atom. Uh, when the plate has a particular radius uh, r. Now, at some critical value of the radius uh, and the critical value of the tip radius we can write as rc, uh, delta gr will equal to zero because all of the chemical free energy change is consumed in creating the interface. Uh, so if I substitute these values into this equation, then I get delta G infinity is equal to sigma times the volume per atom divided by the critical value of the plate tip uh, at which all of the chemical free energy is consumed in creating interface. Now I can substitute uh, this value of delta G infinity into our equation for delta G R. So uh, delta G R becomes sigma V A over the critical 
radius minus that and therefore therefore we can write that we can write that the ratio delta gr over delta g infinity is equal to 1 minus rc over r so compared with a completely flat interface uh, where the chemical free energy change is this quantity we will reduce the effect of the chemical free energy change by the ratio given by this equation so all we have to do is multiply our equation for the lengthening rate of the plate by this quantity here to scale it by the cost of creating interfacial energy so the lengthening rate of the plate is simply given by d upon r into the concentration terms okay, multiplied by 1 minus the critical dip radius over r okay. and obviously if the plate has the critical dip radius then the velocity becomes zero So consider a cylinder, which, which is this cylinder uh, at the tip of the parabolic uh, cylinder plate, uh, and it has a length L and a radius R. And its area is given, uh, surface area is given by 2 pi R times L, and its volume is given by pi R squared times L. So the rate at which the area changes with the radius is 2 pi into L and the rate at which the volume changes with the radius is 2 pi RL so we obtain a relationship between the increment of area and the increment of volume as a function of the plate tip radius now supposing that I set this increment of volume to the volume of a single atom then the increment in area due to the addition of one atom is given by this equation and therefore the cost of creating that additional increment of area is simply the interfacial energy per unit area multiplied by the volume per atom and divided by the tip radius. That cost has to be accounted for. Now, if g infinity is the chemical driving force in other words if we have a flat interface or so when the interface translates there's no creation of new interface so this is uh, effectively the free energy difference between an atom in uh, the austenite and an atom in the ferrite the chemical driving force if you like that has to be reduced by the cost of creating interface when the interface is curved so our effective driving force is smaller than the available chemical free energy change and there will come a point when the tip radius is so fine that all of this is consumed in creating interfacial energy. So if I set delta GR to zero then we get delta G infinity is equal to uh, the interfacial energy per unit area volume per atom divided by the critical plate tip radius. So I can now substitute for this into this equation and we get that the effective driving force is this chemical free energy change minus the cost of creating interface for a given tip radius r and the ratio here of the effective driving force divided by the total available is simply one minus the critical plate tip radius divided by r so in the original derivation that we did we didn't account for this extra cost so if we just take that original derivation and scale it by this then we get the lengthening rate which does take account of the plate tip radius uh, of the creation of uh, interfacial area and when i plot this graph 
this was the original graph where we neglected the creation of uh, interface uh, and this is the corresponding graph when we include the cost of interface with the lengthening rate going to zero when the plate tip radius is the critical radius rising to a maximum and then falling gently as uh, the cost of creating interface becomes smaller and smaller because the interface curvature uh, is becoming flat. Now, um, this equation again is only giving us a relationship between the plate tip radius and the lengthening rate. Uh, it's not actually picking a particular plate tip radius. So a common assumption that is made is that the plate will adopt a tip radius which gives us the maximum lengthening rate. Uh, so this cannot be formally justified because you could have a maximum entropy production rate, for example, and uh, various other criteria. Uh, we can ignore interface stability criteria because this is a displacive transformation and therefore you know, its morphology is determined entirely by strain energy minimization. But we, let's assume that the plate grows with a tip radius that gives us the maximum growth rate. When we plot uh, for many different alloys the lengthening rate of Weidmann Staden ferrite, uh, this is the calculated lengthening rate and measured lengthening rate, taking account of capillarity, which was the cost of creating new interface. Uh, we, in fact, get the correct trend here. Uh, but we actually get a slightly higher growth rate than uh, would be predicted using that equation. Okay. Now, bear in mind that a parabolic cylinder is, is a nice smooth geometric object and uh, Weidmann and ferrite will not necessarily exactly be the shape of Weidmann and ferrite. So this is a good prediction of theory that the lengthening rate depends on all the variables that we've described and it does in fact uh, predict correctly if, if uh, slightly um, underestimating the growth rate. Okay. Right, um, so to summarize, the mechanism of transformation is displacive, undoubtedly displacive, uh, but carbon must partition during growth. And pairs of plates grow together in a back-to-back -to -back formation in such a way that they are mitigating each other's strain energy. And that's why it's possible to get transformation at small undercoolings. I mentioned to you when we were selecting the tip radius, which gave us the maximum growth rate, that ideas based on interface stability Know, that uh, a flat interface in, in fact breaks up into waves and those are our plates of Venus and ferrite is essentially an incorrect hypothesis because the morphology is determined entirely by strain energy and the interface stability idea doesn't work anywhere because we can get uh, Wiedmannstadt and ferrite forming in carbon-free alloys where there is no diffusion. Okay. Uh, so all the mathematical models, uh, for example, the phase field models and so on, which talk about interfacial stability, are incorrectly founded as far as Weidmann and Ferret is concerned. Uh, the plate grow by a homogeneous shear of the parent lattice with the carbon atoms moving during the transformation. But the movement of the carbon atoms doesn't really, uh, doesn't influence the change in crystal structure. So this is a displacive transformation, which occurs at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon ahead of the plate tip, if carbon exists in your alloy. Now, there is another transformation, which is the growth of vanadium hydride in vanadium, which follows exactly the same mechanism. Uh, but in that case, um, uh, the vanadium hydride uh, absorbs the hydrogen from the matrix as the particle grows. Okay. Uh, but it is a para-equilibrium 
uh, it, sorry, I haven't mentioned the term para equilibrium, but that basically means that the ion atom to substitutional solid ratio is maintained constant everywhere during such a transformation, but subject to that constraint, carbon can partition. Okay, thank you very much. That's all about Wiedner's sun parite. Hi Emma, carbon is an interstitial solute in iron. It diffuses much more rapidly than iron. Is it possible to have a displacive transformation in which just the carbon partition? I think so Lizzie. Do you remember when we were young, we talked about Twidman statin ferrite? Oh yes. You mean the plates of ferrite that grow in austenite at temperatures which are often above T0? That is right. The growth is accompanied by a shape deformation which is an invariant plane strain. But two plates grow together in a mutually accommodating manner. I guess the puzzle is how the crystal structure change is achieved by a deformation, but the ferrite never has an excess concentration of carbon, which partitions into austenite. It is not that mysterious Lizzie. The plates simply grow by a displacive mechanism, but at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon in the austenite ahead of the interface. I get it. This is a paramilitary transformation in which the large atoms are displaced but the small ones partition so as to achieve uniform chemical potential. That is correct. A similar transformation occurs in vanadium hydride, as was shown by Wayman and his co-workers. Of course, I remember reading about that. It follows that cementite can also grow by a displacive mechanism. Carbon in that case diffuses towards the carbide as it grows. Yes, one should not be surprised to discover a surface relief when cementite precipitates at low temperatures. Enough talk Lizzie. Aren't you going to Darwin College for lunch? <laughs>